So I'll start introducing our next speaker, Michael Sklash, um, with the Dragon Corporation, and I'll turn it over to you so that you have every second of your time. <laughs> Great. Um, I just had a, a couple comments up, up front before I start. <clears throat> I'm colorblind, so if I make mistakes describing colors of things, and also when I was practicing, I realized I was very liberal with question marks. So sometimes there are some extraneous question marks there. And also my third thing before I start is that um, I wasn't sure about the level of the conference when I did my presentation or prepared it. And I think I underestimated <clears throat> the educational level. So I apologize in advance if some things seem really basic. Um, now, I won't tell you the jokes about getting old to start with, um, so you be saved that. So Dragon is a small consulting firm, a boutique firm uh, in Farmington Hills, Michigan, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And uh, Fatima, Fatima Vakili is uh, an associate. She's a hydrogeologist. I'm a hydrogeologist uh, with the Dragon Corporation. I got my start in looking at nitrate in the 1970s uh, on the Canadian side. We had a program called PLUARG. I was a graduate student, pollution from land use and agricultural research group. And it's funny that I'm talking about the same things that I talked about 45 years ago. Um, and, and it's still relevant. And I want you to know the pictures I'm gonna show are from two dairies in New Zealand that I visited and worked on and uh, the work I actually did in, in the United States. And you'll see those. So um, this um, started um, when I, I was involved in a litigation um, case. And the question was, should we monitor every spreading field uh, where manure is put with a monitoring well to look at the nitrate concentration and seeing if it's causing an effect. And I also was listening to a, a webinar by uh, Dr. Harder from UC Davis, uh, who was talking about variability of nitrate in um, some fields in central California. And I sketched out this diagram and eventually became a, a more a complicated diagram. So um, where does nitrate in the groundwater come from? And this, this is something that, that dairy producers are often faced with as they, uh, they have to meet regulations. And the answer is it's complicated. So this kind of sketches out um, where the nitrate might come from and how it might change annually. And then the previous speaker pointed out that the cows like certain parts to uh, certain areas to drop their, their load that will become uh, nitrogen or nitrates. Um, so we can have precipitation that varies every year. So, you know, if you're using a, a practice that you didn't use uh, five years ago, the results of, of today's groundwater tests will not reflect your uh, change in practice because it takes a number of years for the nitrate to reach the water table, depending on the depth of the water table and the geology. Um, in this particular case, where we had a water table that was very deep, about 50 feet, it took about five years. But uh, another case that I've been working on, it's about a 20 foot deep water table with a sand environment, it's about 20 years. And then, so we've got um, different topography on the surface that causes certain areas to, to get more infiltration. Um, we have uh, legacy nitrate that comes in uh, below the water table and that can vary with depth and the, lay, and the groundwater flow direction can vary seasonally. And then we have, um, we have uh, like center pivot irrigation wells that will draw up a large amount of water from deep below the water table and mix that on top. So 
how are we going to use a single monitoring well on field to characterize where the nitrate came from? And that was simple geology, just like a sandbox. But what if you had geology that, that is implied by this figure? This is an old USGS map from the uh, Mississippi Delta showing meanders, and really it looks the same in the third dimension. It, it's really complicated. Uh, this case study, uh, we had an issue with legacy nitrate. We knew the groundwater was coming in from northwest to southeast, uh, and it was already high in nitrate uh, coming to the, uh, the dairy. And, and we knew there were decades of center pivot irrigation with lots of commercial fertilizers being applied. So the question was, or the problem was, the upgradient well for the dairy, which would be in the top left-hand corner, has low nitrate concentration, well below the drinking water limit. When we know the legacy nitrate is 20, 30, 40, 80 milligrams per liter, and it's coming towards the dairy. How did that happen? And the, the permit limits that were being proposed by the regulators was based on this single upgradient monitoring well, right up in that corner. So just some features of the, uh, the dairy. This is, I think it was 8,000, 9,000 uh, dairy cattle. Um, we had some manure storage ponds, one covered, one not, some stormwater ponds on the left or west side. Uh, the milking parlor in the middle. I have to point out that I am a city person, and this is the first milking parlor that I saw. It was pretty neat. Um, feed storage area was paved, non-contact with manure, and the vegetative treatment area, which is simply a place where the runoff from the feed storage area goes. And this was also controversial, whether it adds nitrate to the groundwater. And then this is uh, monitoring well D, which is the questionable upgradient monitoring well in the groundwater flow direction. So the key permit issue is based on one monitoring well, MWD. So I wanted to focus on this area and try to figure out what's going on here. This is a conceptual model of, of the, the site. It's all sand. Uh, the water table is about 20 feet below ground. Um, the groundwater is coming in from the northwest. There's the MWD upgradient well. The groundwater flows under the, um, the dairy and off beyond the dairy. We have legacy nitrate coming in. We know that. So is MWD an upgradient well we can use to decide whether the dairy is going to increase the nitrate concentration in the groundwater. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to look at whether this upgradient well was really upgradient, just because it was looked like it was upgradient. So we put data loggers into a bunch of monitoring wells and uh, generated continuous um, hydrographs, water level graphs, and groundwater flow maps to figure out whether the flow changed with time. And what you're looking at here on the left is the northwest corner of the VTA, vegetative treatment area, and MWD is on the right side. And there's another well there, there's a deeper well that is monitoring legacy nitrate. We were lucky, kind of, to have a huge storm in March, so it was already wet. And you can see that the vegetative treatment area flooded. And I think it flooded a lot, but this was the one we were out there sampling. And this is the hydrograph of what these wells look like. Monitoring well A and B are upgradient of this field. And monitoring well D is the one that is really spiky. So the water level went up episodically um, two feet, two and a half feet, when we had these big storms. So we knew there was episodic mounding of the water table MWD. The water got to the water table very quickly when it ponded in the vegetative treatment area. And does episodic mounding affect the water quality at MWD? Did it dilute 
the nitrate there. So what we did was we looked at three wells, A, B, and C, in the field that was up gradient and monitored the groundwater flow direction. Did it change during the year? And the red bar, if it is red, um, is the nitrate, nitrate concentration uh, on a monthly basis. And MWD, you can see on the right side of the diagram near the vegetative treatment area. And what we saw was that the nitrate concentration varied a lot, 20 times or more during the year at the upgrade at monitoring well because of the groundwater flow direction. So yes, episodic mounding affects water quality, MWD, ignore the question mark. So we do a lot of litigation work. So I wanted to get a number of different ways of looking at this to convince the regulators. So I, I wanted multiple lines of evidence. I, I wanted to use environmental isotopes. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, um, but I'll explain it uh, very briefly. So can we tell in another way that MWD, the groundwater changed there? And can we tell if legacy um, groundwater or nitrate was due to manure spreading and the manure was coming from the dairy and being spread on the fields all around. So environmental isotopes are defined as <clears throat> atoms with the same number of protons in the nucleus, but different numbers of neutrons. And those neutrons make uh, the environmental isotopes behave differently in the environment. They're heavier if they have more neutrons. So we use the isotopes in water molecules and in nitrate. And first we're, we'll talk about the oxygen 18 and deuterium. These are naturally occurring stable isotopes in, the, in hydrogen and oxygen. And they tend to uh, give different concentrations depending on the temperature. And um, so we see that in cold areas uh, like the Arctic, the bluish colors and the uh, equatorial areas are yellowish and, and orangish. But even during the year at a, a single location, you've got winter temperatures and summer temperatures, and the groundwater takes on a homogenized value. So you usually get a pretty, um, a pretty uniform groundwater value, but each storm can be different depending on, did it come out of the Gulf of Mexico? Did it come from the Pacific? Was it influenced by the Great Lakes? So... We looked at the water in the wells. You can see up the top right hand, whoops, I wanna go back. That's not gonna go back. The top right hand corner, MWD, the upgradient well, whoop. MWD, the upgradient well in the top right hand corner uh, was uh, plotted with the oxygen 18 concentration and deuterium concentration. Monitoring wells A and B are the ones that were in the upgradient field, the other wells are in other parts of the area. The um, uh, VTA, the water we collected out of the VTA, we assumed was the precipitation. And we looked at, oh, I'm missing some things. Um, MWD, you can see, moved to the VTA water. So there was another demonstration that the um, MWD, the upgradient monitoring well, actually um, became replaced, the shallow groundwater, by storm runoff, no question mark. The other isotopes that we used were nitrogen-15 and oxygen-18 and the uh, nitrate uh, to determine if the manure uh, or chemical fertilizer caused the legacy nitrate problem coming from upgradient, and especially whether manure that this dairy had been applying was affecting the groundwater. And this is a plot on the left of um, nitrate against nitrogen 15 against oxygen 18 in the nitrate. And it shows various fields that uh, are indicative of animal waste sources of nitrate and chemical fertilizer and soil nitrogen. And um, we analyzed a few of our samples on the top. Oh, this is where I have the circles. MWA, B, and C are upgradient of the dairy. 
So they would be the legacy nitrate coming in. You can see the concentrations of, of nitrate are, are very high. I put in bars here to show the ranges of where the nitrogen 15 should uh, set for various types of, um, of sources of nitrogen or nitrate. And you can see MWD, the background well, very low concentration, but all of them show that we're not dealing with animal waste. So conclusions, uh, the high resolution groundwater monitoring water levels help to show that MWD was not representative. Water isotopes confirm that. Nitrate isotopes help to confirm that the legacy nitrate uh, was, um, was mostly chemical fertilizer that had been applied. So the outcome was the regulator recognized a problem with MWD, the upgradient monitoring well, and allowed an alternate concentration limit of the dairy that was in the 30s. So it went from, I think originally six that they had put in the permit to the 30s. So now the dairy can operate and what's coming out the back end of the dairy on the downgradient side in the groundwater has a little more chance of being successful than if, if you had six, because the, the legacy nitrate was way higher than what the regulators um, admitted it could be. So, so where does the nitrate in the groundwater come from? It's complicated. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one quick question. Yeah, so we met with them many times. And uh, again, when you, when you have multiple lines of evidence, uh, they, they, I think they start to believe it. Um, and, and they did give in on this one. And um, I'm not sure they totally recognized the, the science, but um, I think that they were overwhelmed by the information. So do you see a lot of problems like that? Yes. <laughs> Is that common in Canada? And stuff? Uh, yeah, I do most of the agricultural work that I do in um, the United States. Okay. I, I live in Canada, but I work in the States. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's often a, educating people on things because, you know, although the science has been around for a long time, like the, I, I used oxygen isotopes uh, for my PhD thesis in the seventies and nitrate has been used the nitrate isotopes for 30 years. Maybe they're not reading it. So you now they need to be introduced. Okay. Can we do one really quick question? <laughs> we'll start one. So just I've been a in second. some Sorry. discussions with townships who want to, uh, control the installation of large solar farms. And some of them have insisted that they want to have uh, soil mon water monitoring in the farm to make sure that the nasty chemicals that were used in making solar panels don't get in the groundwater. Of course, they continue to use commercial fertilizers and herbicides and <laughs> insecticides and <laughs> things on the same soil. Uh, but uh, have you ever run into a situation where, where someone was uh, trying to uh, establish a baseline for installation of solar farms? Ready to go. Sorry, we never worked with the solar farms, but it, it's essentially the same problem. You know, there's going to be a lot of variability due to, you know, we can use the analogy of, of, of the cattle out in the field that they, they, there might be places that are preferential that you do have an issue and that may not be affected or in the flow line of your monitoring well or vice versa that your monitoring well isn't there you know so it's we we do uh mostly industrial uh consulting except for me um and and it is an issue like how much information do you need and there are lots of ways that you could get lots of information quickly without installing monitoring wells uh, that the regulators don't like as as permanent monitoring wells but you could get the information to define where you should monitor 